Hello, I'm Jim Amon. I have uh, recently published a book through the Sourlands Conservancy called Seeing the Sourlands. It's a collection of 64 essays and well over 100 photographs that I've taken, all of them dealing with plants and animals and natural processes that occur in the Sourland uh, region. The, um, the book uh, was published in December and it uh, seems to have hit a chord. There are a lot of people who are uh, interested in the Sourlands and, and want to know a little more about it. And that in fact is exactly why I wrote the book. I, I wrote the book because I have for many years led nature walks in the Sourland region and found that people are interested but they don't know very much about it and they'd like to know some more. I'm an amateur uh, or a, a sort of a wannabe botanist myself uh, because I did not study it in college, but I have had a career which has um, been always, almost, almost always about the outdoors. Uh, for 30 years, I was the director of this DNR Canal Commission. And for 10 years, I was the director of stewardship for the DNR Greenway Land Trust. Uh, after that, I was very briefly a member of the Board of Trustees for the Sourlands Conservancy, and that caused me to have a great affection for that organization. And I was very happy that even when I left the board, they allowed me to publish once a month my Seeing the Sourlands essays and photographs. Uh, what I'm going to do is read one of the essays uh, for you today, and I hope that you enjoy it and learn a little something and get motivated to go out and see the Sourlands. The American Beech Tree. People who are trying to understand the natural world of the Sourlands can rely upon a number of principles regarding the structure and function of the Eastern forest. One of them is that forests grow in vertical layers. At the top is the canopy layer. Under it is the understory, then the shrub, and finally the ground layer where ferns, grasses, and woodland flowers live. Another principle is that as trees age and increase in girth, their bark must expand. And so bark on the trees in the sourlands get furrows or plates or strips. The way the bark accommodates growth is one of the defining characteristics of a tree. A third principle, this is more like a law than a principle, is that the deciduous trees lose their leaves in winter. If they don't, they risk providing platforms for snow to build upon, creating enough weight to break limbs or entire trees. American beech trees defy all three of these principles. That defiance, that I'll do it my way attitude is part of the reason that I really like beaches. If you come across a beech grove in the forest, it is likely that there will not be other species at any level. Unlike the other trees in the Sourlands, beaches retain their lower limbs, creating a shade that is so dense it retards the growth of even shade tolerant species. Their lower limbs remain small, even spindly, but they do not atrophy and they die and they, and, and they do not die from the lower light like the limbs of the other deciduous trees. Further, while beeches can reproduce from their seeds, they seldom do. Instead, they send shoots up from their shallow roots. That means that beeches and their shoots occupy all of the space. The shade in a beech grove is all the more dense because beeches retain the leaves on their lower branches and on saplings throughout the year. There is no known evolutionary advantage for a tree in the Sourlands to refrain from retain some of its leaves through the winter, but beeches do. The upper limbs of beech leaves turn yellow uh, and in the fall and drop but those on the lower limbs and on the saplings turn a rich reddish brown and then start fading as winter sets in. By early spring, the leaves are a pale parchment, but they remain on the limbs until the new leaves arrive. The bark on beeches also defies the standard. It remains a smooth gray sheet from its early age until it dies. It doesn't furrow like a tulip or plate like a dogwood or develop strips like a shagbark hickory. It just gets thinner and thinner. 
I find the pale, smooth, smooth bark on beaches beautiful, but unfortunately, there are some knife-wielding visitors to the woods who find it an irresistible chalkboard on which to memorialize their presence or their love for someone else. Interestingly, although carving on a tree is clearly an act of vandalism and disrespect for the tree, I cannot think of a single instance when I've seen a message of hate on a beech tree. Sometimes there might be a naughty word, but never a message of hate. Since trees get bigger from the top up, those initials will remain on the, at the same height above the ground for the rest of the tree's life. And American beaches can live for about 250 years. In fairness, I should point out that this carving does not in itself cause the tree to die. The opening into the Cambian layer made by the carving could be an entrance into the tree for insects or funguses that could kill the tree, but the carving will not. Beaches flower in the spring, but their flowers are small and yellow and come out at the same time that the tree's leaves come out, so they are seldom seen. Over the course of the summer, the flowers, if they've been pollinated, produce a cluster of three or four nuts. These nuts are highly sought after in the fall by squirrels seeking to build their winter caches and by several other animals, raccoons, foxes, mice, bear, deer, blue jays, and grouse. It is difficult to get the meat out of a tough beech nut shell, but if you smash it with a rock and taste the meat, you will be rewarded. In fact, humans can eat much of the tree. The new leaves are quite tasty, as is the inside of the bark. Cutting strips of bark to taste them, unless you are starving, is another de desecration of the tree. The Latin name for this tree, Fagus grandifolia, means edible large leaves. The famous beech nut gum and baby food, by the way, had absolutely nothing to do with the nuts from beech trees. I said that I like beeches because they are contrary to the normal principles of how trees in the eastern forest grow. But I really love them because when the sun hits their pale gray bark, it produces a soft glow that is one of the loveliest things in the forest.